hotel room. Oh. Nothing in the drawers, but I'll take a look anyway. Nothing except the Gideon Bi Bible. Mm. What's your name? Mm. Your name? Dodd. And who did this to you? What? Who did this to you? You did. How do we define ourselves? This is a question that sits at the very heart of the human experience and has plagued humanity, well, for as long as we can remember. But while the question could be taken in two ways, A, what do we define ourselves as? Or B, what method do we use to define ourselves? Christopher Nolan's Memento takes us on a deep dive into the latter. This is due to the fact that we find ourselves following and identifying with a protagonist who has more or less lost his ability to maintain a coherent identity due to his condition. And yes, I know, like all of the characters in the film exclaim whenever it's brought up, most of you already know about his condition. For the uninitiated, Leonard suffers from enterograde amnesia and is thus unable to create new memories after an event which caused the condition's onset. Hold on, I'm just gonna write this down. Oh, it's easy. Just go straight Trust out. Trust me, I need to write this down. While near the beginning of the film, we feel quite sure that this moment was also the moment of his wife's death, by the end, we're not quite so sure, as numerous characters have sowed seeds of doubt into our minds as to who to trust. And, spoiler alert, you shouldn't be trusting the guy who is unable to make new memories. What am I gonna do, just, just all of a sudden just jump up and grind my feet on somebody's couch? Like it's like it's, you know, something to do? Come on, I got a little more sense than that. Yeah, I remember grinding my feet on Eddie's couch. <laughs> There's considerable research which has shown how memories shape identity, and how people with memory faults have also started losing aspects of their identity. One such patient, Jimmy G, was identified by the late writer and neurologist Oliver Sacks in 1975. The 49-year-old mariner essentially woke up one day, unable to remember what had happened to him after the age of 19, and was unable to make new memories. Forever trapped in a subjective bubble, where he's forced to relive a single moment of time, much like our protagonist in the film, who, coincidentally, is obsessed with finding a man called John G. But we've also discovered that we don't access and use all available memories when we create our personal narratives. At any given moment, we choose and pick what to remember, and how we remember it. We also create personal narratives by relying on a psychological screening mechanism called the monitoring system, which labels mental concepts as memories, but not others. These concepts are vivid and rich in detail and emotion, and are more likely to be marked as memories because of their ability to allow us to re-experience the episodes. Without our awareness, these concepts then pass a plausibility test which screens whether the events we've remembered fit within our personal history and the laws of physics. For example, if the memory is of us flying like Superman, then we know this is fake, or probably a dream, and we won't select it as a personal memory. Furthermore, the selected memories must also fit with the current idea we have of ourselves. So, if a memory conflicts with how we see ourselves today, it's unlikely to be greenlit for easy access. On top of that, even when we correctly rely on our memories, they can be highly inaccurate or outright false. This is because remembering is a highly reconstructive process that depends on knowledge, self-image, needs, and goals. Which is why, even with the assistance of photos, we're likely to interpret the photos based on what we imagine is happening, rather than what is happening, which is exactly the way that Leonard operates in the film. So you lie to yourself to be happy, there's nothing wrong with that. We all do it. Who cares if there's a few little details you'd rather not remember? Picking and choosing memories is normal, guided by self-enhancing biases necessary for self-worth, which lead us to rewrite our past so that it's more in keeping with what we feel and believe in the present. But Leonard is forced to push this to the extreme, since his present is so volatile. What am I doing? Oh, I'm chasing this guy. No, he's chasing me. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's make sure that we're all up to speed with Nolan's first time-bending narrative before we dive into how that relates back to the larger themes of memory and identity. I got a lead on a place. Oh, what the hell you want to go there? You know it. Yeah, it's just this fucked up building. Why do you want to go there? Don't remember. Memento splits itself into two clearly signposted sections, one in color and one in black and white, which are intercut. While the black and white scenes progress forward in time, linearly, the key action takes place in color and moves backwards in the plot every time we cut back to it. During a rare interview he gave back in the early 2000s, Nolan explained that he wanted to tell the story as subjectively as possible from Leonard's perspective, and so decided it should be told backwards from the start and broken up in flashbacks with moments from the present. You know, as every filmmaker does with their first film project. 
The coloured scenes represent Leonard's subjective experience, while the black and white scenes are more objective. But as we reach the end, the two begin to merge, with the colour scenes becoming less subjective and more objective, while the black and white scenes begin losing their objectivity in place of something more subjective, making us question everything we'd been told up until that point. Nolan has explained this arrangement of the plot through a hairpin diagram, where the film's plot roughly starts and ends in the first few minutes of the film, while the narrative, meaning the film as a whole, ends right in the middle of the plot. Beg my wife's forgiveness before I blow your brains out. Leonard, you don't know what's going on. Here it's worth making a really important distinction between plot and narrative. The plot is a linear events which happen within the world of the film, thus the plot of Memento is more or less Leonard's life, from an insurance salesman to the killing of Teddy, which happens to be the first thing we see, but the last event in the film's plot, while the narrative explains the way the film is told to us. So, how Christopher Nolan chose to give us different pieces of plot information at different points in the film's runtime. With that sorted, let's break down the plot first to make clear what's going on. And interestingly, when looked at this way, the plot of Memento is pretty simple. It starts way before the main events of the film, with the background of Leonard working as an insurance investigator and living with his wife. Then one day, the spark that changes everything comes along, the rape and murder of Leonard's wife in their home. We'll come back to whether this is really what happened. During the event, Leonard is knocked unconscious and develops his condition. After an unknown jump in time and a move from San Francisco to LA, we enter the black and white sequence. Here we find Leonard in a dingy, sleazy motel room and he fills us in on all his note writing and tattoo labeling systems while trifling through his information and the search for revenge by killing the mysterious John G. He spends much of the sequence chatting on the phone to an unknown individual who we're led to believe is Teddy, who calls himself a cop and is definitely of the crooked variety. My car. This is your car. Oh, you're in a playful mood. It's not good for you to make fun of someone's handicap. Just trying to have a little fun. At this point, Teddy claims to have found John G, a drug dealer going by the name of Jimmy. So, Teddy sets up a meeting with Jimmy, which Leonard attends, before killing Jimmy and taking a photo of his corpse. Tasting a hint of revenge, the film comes into full colour, and we find ourselves at the film's largest revelatory moment, lying at the end of the narrative, but right in the middle of the plot. Teddy arrives at the scene, cutting Leonard's feelings of revenge short, explaining that Jimmy wasn't the real John G. Instead, Teddy reveals he was, at least supposedly, the cop assigned to Leonard's case. And while the rest of the police force didn't search for John G because they believed he didn't exist, Teddy actually helped Leonard track him down. But Teddy reveals that they tracked him down months ago and Leonard merely forgot about it due to his condition and the misleading notes and tattoos he had. Because of this, Leonard continued searching for his revenge despite already finding it. As such, Teddy sets him along to kill Jimmy, hoping to split the thousands of dollars Jimmy had with him between the two. But Leonard can't stomach this, so instead of writing a note to remind him that John G is dead, he finds a new John G, extending his search for revenge and thus, more or less, giving him a reason to live. Fortunately for him, Teddy can be exactly that, given his name was John Edward Gamble. So, Leonard sinisterly writes, don't believe his lies, on the back of Teddy's Polaroid, and burns the evidence of the previous two times he murdered his John G. Then the film ends, but we're only halfway through the plot. So to trace the plot, we're now reversing the runtime of the film, looking at only the sequences in color. It's all backwards, I mean, like, maybe you get an idea about what you want to do next, but you don't remember what you just did. After claiming Jimmy's car, suit, and stash of $250,000 as his own, Leonard pulls up at Ferdy's bar and is greeted by Natalie, who seems to mistake him for someone else, and rightfully too, as being Jimmy's girlfriend, she recognizes the car and suit. Natalie brings Leonard home and openly admits she's going to manipulate him into killing a guy named Dodd, an associate of Jimmy who claims Natalie must have stolen the drug money in Jimmy's car. This scene seems pretty grim and manipulative when viewed in the film's narrative, but when we understand that Leonard literally killed her boyfriend and took their possessions, well, it seems a lot more justified. To keep it short, Leonard then takes Dodd hostage, forgets who he is and goes back to ask Natalie. Natalie explains, but more importantly, she provides Leonard information about his John G, his license plate number. And, yep, it's Teddy's, forcing Leonard to mark him for death. Sure enough, a few scenes later, Teddy is shot in the head by Leonard. Arriving back at the end of the hairpin, back at the very first moments of the film, we can only guess whether Leonard's killing spree will continue. Throughout the narrative delivery of this plot, Nolan does something really remarkable, which only a master could pull off. 
That is to allow us to feel that we're in the same state of mind as the protagonist, despite him having memory loss and the audience, well at least the vast majority of us not. How am I supposed to heal if I can't feel time? This is why every time Leonard looks at something puzzling within the film, we do too. And this is all down to the hairpin narrative device. Through this, Nolan pinpoints that the film articulates an idea of the tension between our subjective view of the world, the subjective way we have to experience life, and our faith in an objective reality beyond that. And this point is both articulated through the character himself, as well as the audience experience of watching Memento. But for most viewers, this is going to touch on an interesting nerve that is assumed protagonist-centered morality. In other words, the assumption that a film's protagonist, in our case Leonard, is the good guy. Because of this, we find ourselves boundlessly suspicious of others and redeeming of Leonard. We squirm at Teddy's shifty expressions, reel at the bitter regression of Natalie to Leonard, and continuously side with the revenge-seeking, off-the-handle maniac that is Leonard, while sweeping the blaring, obvious fact that he's an unreliable narrator, and someone who is slowly transforming into a serial killer. Not to say that this isn't what Nolan wants, as it most certainly is, but it's fascinating how we immediately trust the most untrustworthy person in the room, simply because they are the protagonist. Looking closer at Leonard, the untrustworthiness is of course a result of his condition, but more fundamentally, it's due to a loss of identity. Throughout the film, Teddy keeps reminding him of this. You don't know who you are. I'm Leonard Shelby. I'm from San Francisco. That's who you were. That's not what you become. This question of the difference between what you were and what you are troubled 17th century philosopher John Locke and others, causing Locke to, well, lock the two together. He claimed that a person is a thinking intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself, the same thinking thing in different times and places, while defining personal identity as the sameness of a rational being. Together, these form an ideal where one's identity is inherently tied to their ability to identify themselves, both past and present. Leonard has evidently lost this faculty, meaning that he has more or less lost his entire identity along with it. He even references something very close to Locke's words at the very end of the film. I have to believe in a world outside my own mind. I have to believe that my actions still have meaning, even if I can't remember them. I have to believe that when my eyes are closed, the world's still there. This loss of identity leaves him completely open for the manipulation we see in the film, as he no longer holds any compass to orientate himself and his relationships to others, leading to his run-in with Dodd due to Natalie's manipulation, or him killing Jimmy due to Teddy, or even him murdering Teddy after he manipulated himself. The film probes into the fallibility of memory when Teddy points out, Your notes could be unreliable. And Leonard responds, Memory's unreliable. Ah, oh, please. No, 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 really. Look, memory can change the shape of a room, it can change the color of a car and memories can be distorted. They're just an interpretation, they're not a record. Of course, Leonard has a point, which can be justified by a simple look at the famous Lost in the Mall experiment. This cognitive psychology experiment involved test subjects having false memories about having been lost in a mall as a child, implanted into their heads merely through suggestion. But at least for me, these two forms of memory are totally different things. On the one hand, we have the fallibility of memory to misremember details, and on the other, we have a complete lack of memory, forcing a profound identity crisis. And this, of course, makes the final line of the film. We all need mirrors to remind ourselves who we are. I'm no different. Resound with a huge, yeah, right, seeing as we're all revenge-seeking nutcases. The discussion of identity links profoundly to the theme of self-knowledge. This is because memory can arguably be seen as a component of self-knowledge, whether it be conscious memory or not. Which leads us back to our initial question, how do we define ourselves? Leonard defined himself through a regimented set of notes, none of which were verifiable, and all of which were totally subjectively created, leading him to believe many things that are far from the truth, both intentionally and unintentionally. He also sought to define himself in contrast to the story of Sammy Jankis, which he recounts through the black and white sequences. Sammy Jankis had the same problem, but he, he really had no system. You really do need a system if, if you're going to make it work. This tells of a man with a similar condition whose wife could not come to terms with it, resulting in her proxy suicide by having him repeatedly inject her insulin with little interval. But Teddy implants a different thought, that Sammy Jankis' story is Leonard's story. That his wife is not killed in the event, but survived and was unable to cope with his condition. In the very closing moments of the film, we even see a flash of Leonard with his wife while having the note-taking tattoos littering his skin, perhaps verifying this claim. 
Although, what actually happened to Leonard is still very much up for speculation, as we don't get nor need any rigid answers to the questions Memento bubbles to the surface. This is because, by its climax, the film managed to do far more than present us with a fascinating plot crafted into an intricately entertaining narrative. It managed to pose profound questions of the fallibility of our subjective viewpoints, the complex nature of our memories, and most of all, it managed to remind us that the question of how do we define ourselves is not at all as easy to answer as it may first seem. With that being said, that's all for today folks. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content, and if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Can I just let myself forget what you've made me do?